Hello and good evening. My name is Dr. Ryan Lynch, Associate Professor of History, and on behalf of the Department of History and Geography, the Columbus State University Honors College, the, and the Colonel Richard Halleck Military History Endowment at Columbus State University, I'd like to welcome you, both those who are with us physically and those who are joining us online to Columbus State. This is especially the case because of the inclement weather today, and we appreciate those of you that are able to join us however you are able. Tonight's conversation on the post 9-11 Army has been part of a series of commemorative events hosted by Columbus State University concerning the 20th anniversary of the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks. For those of us who lived through the attacks and the global war on terror that began immediately after, the events are hard to forget. But for many in the audience today, and indeed to many of our students at, enrolled at Columbus State University today, 9-11 is a historical event and one that should be more fully contextualized and reflected upon, including for those who came after us, who come after us, excuse me. Tonight's event and tonight's speaker are an important part of Columbus State's efforts to reflect and to understand. There are few better speakers that I could have imagined having join us for tonight's conversation about the US military as it transitioned from the Cold War era to the global war on terror than Major General Patrick Donahoe. Major General Patrick Donahoe has served in the United States Army since May of 1989. A native of New Jersey, he attended Villanova University where he studied history, big ups, and he received his commission as an armor officer upon his graduation. With over 32 years as an army officer, Major General Donahoe served in 23 different assignments before assuming his current position as the commanding general of the Army's Maneuver Center of Excellence at Fort Benning. Noteworthy periods include his assignment as a battalion commander in the 4th Infantry Division in Iraq from 2005 to 2006, a tour in Bosnia in 1996 in support of Operation Joint Endeavor, and Kuwait in 2001 during the 9-11 attacks. Two tours to Afghanistan from 2012 to 2013 and 2016 to 2017, and two tours to South Korea, first as a lieutenant and just recently as a major general. Major General Donahoe is a graduate of the United States Naval War College, where he earned his master's degree in national security and strategic studies and was a national security fellow at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Please join me in welcoming General Donahoe to Columbus State University. I don't know. Okay, this profile. I mean, I, I do what I can. All right. I have uh, decided in kind of the speaker series that we put together um, as part of the 9-11 series general to ask each of the speakers that we have invited to the university where they were on September 11th, because each of you have been affected, not just personally, but in your career in a very direct way by September 11th. So to start us off, my question for you is, where were you on September 11th and what was the experience like? Yeah, so, uh, so thanks, Dr. Lynch. You mind if I call you Ryan? You can call me Ryan. Sorry. So. So Ryan, I, I was uh, I was the ex, um, the operations officer for uh, Task Force Centurion, which was a task force that was uh, in Kuwait, about five miles off the Iraqi border, and we had that was a an ongoing rotation of forces that that continued from 1991, the end of the Gulf War, all the way through through the 90s, uh, into the 2000s, to deter aggression from Saddam Hussein's Iraq, and so we had arrived uh, we'd arrived in uh, in Kuwait in July, and we were, you know, we were about ha almost halfway through our rotation, and it was a thousand-man task force. We had uh, uh, two tank companies, a Bradley infantry company, a uh, Bradley-based engineer company. We had a uh, Paladin battery and an MLRS battery, so rocket artillery, and uh, and we also had the brigades reconnaissance troop, which was a a, a cavalry troop, light cavalry troop, with us. So about about a thousand or eleven hundred folks in the uh, in the organization and so you know if you, you think about it um, you know Kuwait's about you know about seven hours ahead of us mm -hmm. uh, so when everything starts to happen in New York City uh, we're late in the afternoon it's almost five o'clock in the afternoon in, in, in Kuwait and I can remember you, you love this right the, the global reach and command and control system of the United States military complex uh, we hear about we hear about it over the BBC World News radio. It is uh, how we hear the the first aircraft was struck uh, the World Trade Center, 
and and uh, then reported the second aircraft the way it was reported. I, I remember looking at the XO, another major, Brian Ebert, and I said, ah, Brian, it's got to be, it's just got to be an errant report, right? Just this is the same airplane, you know, same report. Uh, and then I was, I was outside between the tents and our tactical operations center, and Brian comes walking out and goes, the airplane just hit the Pentagon. And at that point, you know, kind of we knew that, all right, this was, this was something. And so I went running across the sand parking lot that was in front of our operations center and went into the operations center, got the battalion commander, a guy named Bart Howard on the, uh, on the radio. And then we started to, we really started to mobilize at that point to get first the cavalry troop out uh, to set a screen between our location and the Iraqi border, right? Because you know, if you go back and for those who lived it, I mean, the, 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 the palpable kind of, um, you know, unsureness of what was going on, just, you know, everybody's like, okay, hey, what, what do we have to do to secure ourselves mm -hmm. right now, right where we are? And so that continued through the night. We had to pull, we had a unit out training, we had to pull them back in. And, uh, and then it quickly turned towards, because uh, I, you know, I grew up in New Jersey, I grew up right outside New York City, my father worked in New York City his whole adult, adult life. Uh, my big sister was on Manhattan Island on 9-11. And so, you know, I, I looked at Colonel Howard and I was like, hey, sir, we got to start, we got to start finding out who's affected, right? Who's got family in New York City? Who's got family yeah, in the Pentagon? And then, you know, we got to start, we got to start that rotation of folks off the guard mount and then figuring out how folks are going to get in contact with their families uh, back, uh, back in the U.S. to determine if everybody's okay. So it was, that became through that evening uh, into the early morning that kind of who could be possibly affected by that. And then to get, to get them, it took days to get everybody to connect with family to find out, was everybody okay? Yeah, and I mean, we've talked in, you know, my September 11th class that I'm teaching here, you know, at CSU this semester about some of those challenges, especially when you think about the infrastructure in Lower Manhattan at the time, if you had people that were work working in Lower Manhattan, so much was connected to that, that communications mass on the top of the World Trade Center, right, that there were lots of people who had those concerns, even if they didn't necessarily work in Lower Manhattan, where all the communications were routed that way, right, so there were so many of these challenges that, that were presented with that. And, and to think about your kind of experience in, in, in Kuwait there too, General, you know, like, were there people around you, you know, being deployed in the Middle East at the time, at a time where, you know, we, we thought there was peace, right? Were, were there people around you who, as soon as the sort of first plane had hit the World Trade Center, was there a conversation going on about something doesn't seem right about this? And, and did you experience the entire day, by and large, through, through radio? Or, or was there, you know, sort of video coverage of it? So um, it was it was radio for a long time. We had to we had to get a uh, Sky TV out of yeah. out of, England, out of right out yeah. of the UK. UK, and then we were able to start seeing video of of what had occurred. Um, and so when, when you looked at the structure that was in Kuwait at the time, we had out in the desert. You had the 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 tra you know the task force that was out there, the war fighting capability. Then we had a forward headquarters out of Third Army, and that was down. Uh, in the port around Doha, so just north of Kuwait City, was a you know just a concrete series of warehouses. That's where we stored all of the Army prepositioned equipment, uh, but it also had a big big headquarters in there. And to be honest, on on September 10th, that wasn't necessarily you know your your cutting edge folks, your yep. your best and brightest, right? And so very very quickly uh, after 9/11, we start to see this uh, this change of who's now flowing into country to flesh out that headquarters. Um, and then, you know, the other interesting part was you know, we started to see allies start to arrive. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's within about five days where we have really? Australian SAS come into Kuwait and to begin train, training with us. And then we had just south of us was the Ali al Salim airfield. And that was, at the time, uh, you had a British uh, tornado squadron probably about, about six planes or so down there so we had we had tied in with the british and the royal air force regiment that does their airfield security and so all of those relationships became really important as we were trying to ensure that we were secure mm -hmm. right because that was again that was a concern was you know was this going to be some kind of global effort uh, uh to get at uh you know the united states worldwide or was it was it just uh, you know limited to to September 11th, and I, 
I showed you this book. I, I was going day, to right? ask so, you about it, yeah. So this, this book is older than the majority of folks in the, in the audience. Right? Uh, <laughs> so this was my, you know, this is Centurion 3, you know, 11, 11 August to 1 October 01, right? And so there are no, there are no entries from September 11th, uh, but on the 12th September, uh, it's got day after terrorist event written at the, written at the top, right? So yeah, just kind of an interesting thing. And then to, to look in this book at what we were talking about on the left side and then what we start talking about on the right side, we start talking about, you know, what kind of air defense capabilities do we have? What kind of stinger missile teams do we have? Uh, how we can use them, how we can, uh, you know, get the ammunition to them. And then where else in uh, the Arabian Gulf region might they need to go to protect mm -hmm. uh, U.S. interests in the, in the Gulf. And so that was a, you know, when I, when I pulled that out after you and I talked, yeah. that was kind of a, a walk down memory lane for, you know, now 20 years ago. Yeah, and, and that's exactly it, right? Um, we think about all these sort of personal experiences that we have, and of course, somebody in your position, General, you know, like the, the, the meaning that a book like that has of trying to think about not just what your career looks like, what your loved ones look like, what the soldiers who, who you were responsible for, what their experiences were going to be like, especially if they had family, you know, that were going to be affected in, in one form or another, or, or what their careers were going to be affected like. There was so much, I'm sure, that must have been going through your mind at the time. Yeah, I think there was a... I think there was a, you know, just an, an absolute understanding of folks in uniform that their lives had drastically changed, right? And yeah. so we, I was a major, I was about 12 years into service, right? And I knew at that point that, hey, my, the first 12 years of my career were going to look significantly different, different than the next, yeah. you know, the next uh, series of years. And, and, you know, that bears out. I mean, we, yeah. but we kind of knew that that was, uh, a real dividing line in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that leads us really well to, you know, onto the next question that I was going to ask you, right, which is that when you graduated from college and took up your commission, General, the next conflict on the horizon really was the first Gulf War. But of course, you didn't know that in, in 1989, right? Um, and, and Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield. So how has training American soldiers changed since the early 90s? Um, and when we think about both conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq that have happened since? Yeah, I mean, first of all, that's a great question, and of course, uh, it starts with a really, a really faulty premise, right? You, you, you said, hey, you had no idea that Desert Storm was the next thing, but so when I'm commissioned at a Villanova University as an armor officer, you know, the, the, the threat is the Soviet Union, yeah. right? And so it is, it's all the full the gap, it's yeah. the Tan pocket, you know, the, the, the inner German border. Yeah. We're, we're still fighting the Cold War at this point, it, it, training it I mean, army officers in that same are, way. I mean, I, I, you know, I got Rich Satterland out here who commands our 199th Infantry Brigade, and we talked about training our you know, new lieutenants today. You know, when you came into the Army in 1989, I mean, you, you were in fully indoctrinated into how the Soviets fought. Right? So you knew that, hey, if you, saw, if you saw two BRDMs, which are two scout cars, you knew that was the regimental recon. And you knew that when they passed you, five minutes later, you're going to see three BMPs of the combat reconnaissance patrol. Five minutes after that, you were going to see the forward patrol. Five minutes after that, you're going to see the advanced guard main body. Yes, you know, so we had been, we had gone to school on how the Soviets fought. And, and so, and that was all based on, we knew we were going to fight them. We were organized, equipped, trained, and focused on fighting in uh, the you know North German plain, uh, central plains of Germany, you know along the inner German border to at the at the time what was the mantra of the airline battle doctrine which was we're going to fight outnumbered and win mm -hmm. right because of the, of the way the Soviets were organized and equipped, but that get that got to a very very disciplined army that was focused on repetitive training events, going out to our training centers and fighting a opposing force that was organized, equipped, and trained like the Soviet Army. And, and so we, we went through this process of, you know, just, you know, training, 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 and then going out to a laser tag in the desert out in, you know, Fort Irwin, the Mojave Desert in California, to see how we measured up against a very, very good op four that was opposing force that was modeled on the Soviets. And we got very, very good at that. Mm -hmm. And then the Soviet <laughs> Union kind of goes away. Um, and it took us a while 
to start to go, okay, what do we need to train against? Yeah. Right? And we had this, this great muscle memory of, hey, you just gave us a, this gave mm -hmm. us a good army because it's the army we trained to fight the Soviets is the army that destroys the fourth largest army in the world in 1990 and 91. In, uh, in so, the form of Iraq, right, Saddam Iraq, the Iraq. Iraqi army in, in, in Desert Storm, and it was it was you know you know wasn't the playing fields of Eaton. It was the it was the battle you know the laser battlefields of Fort Irwin, California, that gave us that that victory and that overwhelming victory. And so there was there's real reticence to let go of that mm -hmm. until we kind of really understand what the what the next competition is gonna be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you see the army really wrestling with that through the '90s. I said how we're how we're going to transition from a threat-based force to a capability-based force, right? Where we need to develop capabilities to deploy anywhere in the world to fight a yet-to-be-known antagonist, right? And and so that's that's really interesting as you look at the '90s. Then what happens is you get 19, you get 2001, you, you get the 9/11 attacks, and all of a sudden we've got to now start figuring out, okay, what's the next fight? Our light force that goes into to uh, Afghanistan, you know, very very well structured to do that. You, know, you got you got the Rangers that go in and seize Kandahar Airfield. You got our special operations forces operating with CIA paramilitary forces. You know the the premier um, you know light and unconventional forces in the world, supported by the the 10th Mountain Division that goes in. Right, so very very capable of operating in that environment against the the Taliban mm -hmm. right, they were they were against you know fully supported by the joint team I mean stacks of you know aircraft over over Afghanistan yeah, providing precision fire in, uh, in, you know, in the pursuit and support of a proxy force the the Northern Alliance and and so that that force was well trained for that then it became the focused on Iraq and and to and to bring uh, the heavy force up to a level of capability, we could get them into uh, get them into um, Iraq, pair them with the 101st, pair them with uh, the 173rd Airborne coming in from the north after Fourth Infantry Division was denied its ability to come mm -hmm. in from Turkey, um, but to then pursue uh, over 400 kilometers uh, in in a deep uh, ground penetration to seize a, a nation's capital. Right, so that training was very focused on the high end of combat, and then, and then the war starts to change at the end of 2003 and four. So we start to transition into this growing insurgency, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know where there's where, again there's concern about even labeling it an insurgency in yeah. 2004, and then even with my battalion going out to the National Training Center as part of our mission rehearsal exercise, that rotation was divided in half. You had seven days of high intensity combat. There's two force on force, you know, uh, you know, combined arms battalion tanks and Bradleys and, and mm -hmm. pallet and howitzers attacks on a light, you know, a light uh, structured force, another mechanized force. Yeah. Did three of those, two live, uh, two miles, and then we did a live fire, you know, up in battalion live fire. Really exciting, a lot of fun, right? But we kind of knew that hey, this wasn't really going to really prepare us for what we knew we were going to be asked to do. Yeah. And, uh, and then the second half of that training event became uh, wide area security, counterinsurgency. Which ended up being critical in, in, became in critical. Iraq especially, but also in Afghanistan. Right. And so for, for our battalion going into Iraq, um, I rode my tank once in, a, in my year in Iraq. Right. And, and we did As an it. armor officer. And we did it yeah. to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's take the tank out. Right. Yeah. We haven't had that baby out. Right. And so. Yeah, but other than that, it was in Humvee, it was walking, right? it was not, uh, you know, my, my first experience of direct fire combat, I was, I was in a tree line with a pistol. Yeah. Right? It was not, not something Lieutenant Donahoe would have thought he'd been doing as a battalion commander, right? Yeah. And, uh, and learned a lot of lessons, right, uh, you know, of, of what, what you shouldn't do as a battalion commander in combat, right, uh, right, right off the bat. And, and so, you know, again, that training uh, changed dramatically. So when I left Iraq went back to Fort Hood, went back to Fort Hood, and then I went out as a trainer to our national training center, and the the training had completely changed. We had built Iraqi villages, we had Iraqi role players. We, you know, you did. There was no high intensity combat element of that. It was you went in and you did wide area security counterinsurgency mm -hmm. uh, for that whole rotation, 
uh, we could talk about the, you know, there was a RIA stat that we would turn up and down on the units and, you know, the, the kind of the, the phrase was, hey, we want every day at Fort Irwin to be your worst day in Iraq, mm -hmm. right? And so now there's the problem with that is that you, you never gave a unit time to really get into a rhythm of, of doing targeting and planning against yeah. A uh, counterinsurgency threat. If every day they've got you know mass casualty event, they're mm -hmm. they're, replying, they're reacting to, and that that was part of that challenge. And then as we saw that continue, then that focus became more on how to advise and assist host nation forces. Right. So as we stood up uh, the Iraqi army uh, to a greater degree, and, and the Afghan army, uh, or to to some degree, the uh, you know we we started to spend more time training forces on how to how to actually advise and assist, uh, you know, your your host nation forces that were going to be the majority of the close fight. Yeah, there and there's a lot to to think about, of course, there, and so much that we could unpack about it, right? But I want to turn actually to a, a question that I was given by one of the the members of the September 11th class that we're teaching in the history department this semester, and I I should mention actually for everybody that rather than taking questions at the end of, of this, I solicited you know in advance some questions from our Columbus State students about this, and and this one comes from one of our students, Bailey Melton, which really picks on this question of what what were you what was it like for you as a sort of young army officer still. Um, at, in the wake of the September 11th attacks. And, and the question is, what, what were some of the biggest changes in day-to-day -day operations that a senior military leader like you witnessed taking place in those first months following 9-11, and then when we think about into Afghanistan and, and Iraq, because so much about your career, as you had described already, had changed quite dramatically, right? Like the, the career that you expected that you were going to have is, is probably very different than the career that you have had fighting the global war on terror. So hey, Bailey, thanks, thanks for the question. The because uh, because everything changed, right? I mean, you know, again, what we were doing what we were doing on a daily basis in Iraq changed, right? So all of a sudden, we went from kind of being there to train in the in or not in Iraq and Kuwait, being there in the Kuwaiti desert to just train. You know, that was the, that was the benefit of going there was you you had all this open desert and you just went out and trained all of the desert. Well, when September 11th happened, then it all of a sudden became, hey, we got to be really concerned about you know the security of this. You know, we were we then started really operationalizing what we were doing about looking at where were folks trying to cross the Iraqi border to come down uh, into Kuwait. We, we then started doing an awful lot of coordination uh, on the defense of Kuwait op plan that we had. Um, so, um, you know, we had, there was a, there was a MU, a you know, Marine Expeditionary Unit mm -hmm. afloat uh, in the, uh, in the North Arabian Gulf, right? And we had, I can remember that, you know, we had them fly in to, you know, we talked to them about how they were going to tie into our defensive plan uh, in, uh, you know, in Kuwait, North Kuwait City, and what they were going to do, what their capabilities were, and, and how they would best best be employed. Uh, as you can imagine, that that was a lot of that was a lot of interesting fun between you know Army guys and Marines. You know, yeah, without a doubt, a lot, a lot of a lot of bravado, right? It was all good, right? Um, but then, you know, I, I mentioned you know the SAS came mm -hmm. in from Australia. And then when we saw that third army headquarters start to really flesh out uh, as it as it built out uh, to the to really the third army headquarters that's going to fight uh, in OIF, you know, and then really two years later, but uh, that that headquarters starts to starts to expand, and the decision we were a battalion sized organization. Uh, there was a decision made very quickly after 9/11 that they were going to replace our battalion. With a with a brigade, and um, and so the brigade uh, that that uh, came back was uh, really it was a, it was out of first cab, but it was an amalgamation of guys out of uh, blackjack and gray wolf brigades uh, as they were trying to generate combat power to to get into uh, Kuwait because there was real concern that as we were uh, going into Afghanistan that there would be this you know spoiling attack from the Iraqis if possible, so they were trying to trying to build build combat power. Now, with, with that being said, right, so that was what it looked like, you know, from the deserts of Kuwait, uh, but talking, uh, we were out of Fort Riley, Kansas, and talking back to, you know, my, my wife and, and, you know, friends of mine that were at Fort Riley, what had really dramatically changed at Fort Riley is they had gone into guarding themselves, mm -hmm. right, so we, that's when we established, you know, closed posts, you know, before, you know, before 9-11, you could just drive on an army post, right, nobody you know, most of the time, nobody even stops yeah. their car, right? You just drive on the army post. Well, 
Then we shut all the gates down. Well, that meant a soldiers had to now go out and guard the gates. Mm -hmm. Um, and the things you don't necessarily think about as, right. as everything changes, right? Yeah. And, you know, give an 18 year old American male a gun and put him on a gate in America. You know, what's the rules of engagement for, you know, for that, uh, for that young man or woman, right? That's, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that took an yeah. awful lot of, okay, how, when would you employ yeah. any kind of deadly force? And espe yeah, especially a at a time where in the wake of the, the attacks on 9-11, we didn't fully understand if there was going to be something that happened immediately afterwards right. again. And some of what, uh, you know, local local Columbus uh, people, including my students, you know, kind of say who grew up in Columbus, there was this sense, you know, uh, that, wow, you know, we have a major army installation on the south end of our town. Could something happen here? Right. Even though it seems like, you know, in West Georgia, what could really happen? But right. those were questions that were at least in some of our community members' minds at the time. Yeah, but don't worry, we got more tanks than Canada. <laughs> uh, back, so it's all good. <laughs> good to know. Um, so I have, an, I have another question actually here uh, from one of our students. This one is from uh, Abby Parker, who asked, uh, after 9-11, there was a significant influx of young Americans who were making the decision to join the US military. Uh, are there still many people that join the army to sort of fight terrorists like they did in the months after 9-11? Or, or what has army recruitment looked like, not just from the immediate wake of 9-11, where you have all of these fresh recruits who are joining up um, a very different army than you had, you know, you, you had been commissioned into, um, to now people who might be considering joining up in, in 2020 or 2021, where the global war on terror is, is two decades old, right? I mean, it could almost buy beer at this point. Yeah. The, uh, well, first off, Abby, we can sign you up right after this. <laughs> Or, uh, thank you for your service. The, uh, the, uh, so, you know, in the, in the immediate aftermath, you do, you have this, this real wellspring of patriotism and folks who want to, want to serve their country and, and, you know, um, do what the nation's asking of its, of its military forces. Um, I, I think as you, as you go forward in that, I think there, there remains that undercurrent of, um, you know, folks who are, wanting to serve and then wanting to serve a nation in a time of war, right? So there's a little bit of, um, I, I want to do that for the experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, uh, there's a large amount of, I want to do that because my, you know, my grandfather did yeah. that when called in you know, Vietnam. Yeah. Or in, uh, in general, maybe this, this feeling of service, there was always going to be service to country, yeah. whether 9-11 happened or not. Right. And I think, I think what you see today is uh, you see, a steady dump, drumbeat of you know folks who want to join uh, something larger than themselves and be able to give back uh, to the to the country they've grown up in. Um, I mean that's not a that's not a vast majority of Americans, right? But that's that's okay. We don't you know we don't need every American to serve in the military, right? We don't want them to, right? It'd be too many. Um, but for those uh, for those for those who uh, want a you know a pathway you know into the military to serve their country it is uh, and I know you're going to kind of ask me that at the end I mean it's a you know, it's 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 a great place to uh, really to serve your mm -hmm. your fellow citizens thanks general um, another question from a, a student here uh, Paul Kennedy actually um, in the wake of 9-11 um, we know especially now as historians thinking about this right that there was a pretty significant rise in anti-muslim sentiment around the country as many americans you know sort of lashed out and were angry um, and didn't have necessarily a particular understanding of the islam practiced by their neighbors which was an islam that was very different from terrorist groups like al-qaeda so from the perspective of a, an army leader right uh, what kind of efforts were made in the post 9 11 army to combat any kind of anti-Muslim sentiment that might have, you know, lingered amongst people who were joining up in the force of feeling like they needed to do something to, to kind of get back at terrorists, right? Um, was there a noticeable sentiment? Uh, what, what was it like being a leader and trying to think about how we manage anger and frustration and a lack of understanding yeah. of what had happened? Yeah, it's, you know, yeah, there, there are not, and there were not in 2001, an awful lot of, uh, Muslim soldiers in the United States Army, and there are more today than there were in 2001. As a matter of fact, our, our chaplain on uh, on Fort Benning is a is an imam, and, uh, and and so we see more Muslims today serving serving the you know in the army than, than we did back then. But there there was really I think more because I mean most 18, 19, 21 year olds uh, didn't really have a sense of what you know, what a Muslim was, you know, mm -hmm. it, it was, it was more, uh, 
um, you know, the the collusion together of terrorist and 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 Muslim that mm -hmm. that overlaid it, right? So it was this it was this focus on terrorists and trying to define uh, terrorists. But I but I can I can remember in an auditorium similar like this on Fort Hood in 2005, prior to deploying, uh, we had the entire battalion uh, in uh, in the uh, in the auditorium, and we were talking about you know what we were going to do in Iraq and what we should not do in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And and for I'm a I'm I'm a firm believer that every one of you are are capable of incredible kindness and goodness and every one of you are capable of evil. And so you know what what I talked to the battalion about was hey we we've got to make sure that we know when somebody is reaching that point when that they're going to flip that switch. And it's incumbent upon each and every one of us to ensure that we do not allow one of us to, instead of getting off the plane a year from now, mm -hmm. coming out of Iraq, a hero, they come off a felon, right, and a yeah. war criminal. And, and, it's in, and that's contingent of you know, every echelon of leadership and every individual on the battlefield, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, there, there are horrible things that happen in war. And, and that you can really turn a heart black and, and, and watch uh, young men and women do unspeakable things if, if allowed to act on those impulses in the, at the depth of you know, uh, their despair following a horrific event. Yeah. And you know, I, my battalion lost 17 uh, along the Euphrates uh, in 2005 and six. And there was a lot of anger in that battalion. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge for the leadership is to, is to, is to channel that anger and that energy and to ensure that what what is going to preserve folks over time 20 30 years from their tour in combat is the knowledge that they followed the rules of engagement they conducted themselves honorably and lawfully uh, even though they may be part of things that that they wake up thinking about right yeah uh, the, they've got to re rest their head on the on the pillow of, of law right we, mm -hmm. we did what we lawfully allowed, uh, permitted uh, to do in the right circumstances, uh, given those rules of engagement, whether, whether the outcome was something horrible or not. Yeah, and I mean, that in itself, of course, it leads into kind of the next question that I wanted to, to ask you, actually, which is how the global war on terror has evolved, right? I mean, when we went in as a sort of invading force, you know, in, in 2003 to a place like Iraq, for instance, we... I think we knew, and certainly President Bush made public comments, right, that, that, that the global war on terror was not going to be, that it was going to be a generational war. It wasn't going to be something we were in and out of Iraq, and that was it. But the role of the U.S. Army, uh, you know, the infantry, but, you know, all aspects of the U.S. Army was afterwards a, an occupying force. It was a, a hearts and minds, right? It was the counterinsurgency that then developed in the sort of later 2000s. And um, that must have been a challenge, right, to think about how do you create these sort of hardened, hardened warriors, right, whose job is to sort of go in surgically to, 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 to root out evil, to, to root out, you know, uh, those who would mean harm to America's interests, to then winning hearts and minds of everyday civilians in a place like Iraq, right, and not necessarily knowing who was going to be dangerous and, and who was not, especially when you think about, as you described it, people being capable of both great kindness and, 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 and evil. Right. I mean, how was that for you as a leader, you know, needing to sort of train these, these soldiers as the army kind of transitioned to that after 2003, 2004 into, you know, the sort of later 2000s in, in a place like Iraq as an occupying force? Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't think I don't think George W. Casey, who was the, the four star commander in Iraq in, in late 2004, uh, 2005, six and seven. I don't think he gets enough credit for foreseeing the change uh, in the battlefield. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we, in, in our collective memory, uh, the myth is that Petraeus kind of gets off the plane and brings counterinsurgency yeah, back. Brings in you know, yeah. FM 3.24 down from on high. Mm -hmm. um, As if that's how everything works. Right, right. right. Um, when in reality, when, when I went into Iraq in 2005, um, we were, the, the counterinsurgency academy had already been established by General Casey. Right, so I mean, you know, about, early 2005, he had started to bring in, you know, folks who were thinking deeply about, mm -hmm. uh, about counterinsurgency warfare and what we were, what we were facing. And of course, this starts before it's even condoned to talk about insurgency, right? 
And, and so he's, he establishes in Taji, Northwest of Baghdad, this counterinsurgency academy that every incoming battalion commander, not even been company commanders and, uh, and, and battalion sergeant majors and above had to go through uh, the counterinsurgency academy uh, to kind of, kind of, you know, kind of get our heads right. You yeah. know, I mean, hey, look, you're, you're not, coming in here to fight the full the gap you know that, yeah. that fight is done we we pushed all the way to baghdad seized seized baghdad now it's about uh now, now it's about controlling the population right so this is this is again what, what people tend to forget the army is for right mm -hmm. the, the army exists in order to close with and defeat enemy ground formations seize critical terrain and control populations in order to deliver sustainable political outcomes, right? That, that's what your army does. Uh, the Air Force can't do that. The, the Navy cannot do that. Uh, and the Marine Corps is too small to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, even their song talks about battles, not wars, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's for the Marines in the audience. And so the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's our charter then to make sure that as, as, the, as the characteristics of the conflict change, we're capable of changing with it. And I think what you see uh, from 2005 onward is this, is this adoption of counterinsurgency doctrine. Uh, when when uh, General Petraeus comes in with the newly written counterinsurgency manual, um, it, it becomes very, very focused on the monetary aspects mm -hmm. of trying to infuse, you know, you know, e economic opportunity on local populations and try to tie them to their own success. Uh, and then as, as you get into 2007, it becomes in Iraq, it becomes the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, kind of almost buying out of the Sunni, mm -hmm. the Sunnis who are now disenfranchised from Al Qaeda and that's the sons of Iraq and that whole process. And that's, you know, we, we end up buying them, you know, off in many ways. The, the sad part about it, if you look at British Victorian experience uh, with small wars, they always started with that. Mm -hmm. Right, and so the um, when we go back and we look at the lessons, pro probably the the chief uh, lessons learned was to disband the Iraqi army immediately after the fall of Baghdad was probably not the, mm -hmm. the the most rational thing to do when we could have we could have bought them outright, mm -hmm. right, and said, okay, hey, let's keep your units intact. We will we'll pay you. We'll uh, and then we'll use your labor to do things like rebuild, et cetera. Right, you didn't need to rearm them. You could disarm them. You but you could have had some. You could have had some early on successes, and and then and, and that's really the Iraqi story going forward. And then we build up their host nation capability. And by when we're when we're doing the counter ISIS fight, you know that's the Iraqi army fighting that fight. Yeah. You know, enabled by uh, what only the the U.S. can bring, right? Which is precision fires, uh, you know, persistent you know intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance, you know, drone systems and satellites. Yeah. And then precision strike when when needed and required to support that ground force, which in this point was, you know, Iraq. Yeah, that that's fascinating, General. Right, like, and I think for, especially for those of us who haven't served or when we were on the home front, right, when we were just seeing the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq play out over our television, right, and even today as historians, we look back and that's kind of the narrative, right, is precisely what you said. General Petraeus, you know, comes in sort of with counterinsurgency on the mind, thinking about what does this look like. So hearing that there were all of these conversations going on amongst military leaders even prior to that, right, immediately, um, is, is really fascinating, right? And I think it's part of the reason why conversations like this are, are valuable for us to have. Um, so to kind of transition and, and shift gears a little bit, if we think back to your impressive biography that I like, yeah, very long, right? I mean, very, it was very long. Uh, but, way, I kind of like the, I like the stage. Yeah, I mean, couldn't I didn't, get, I didn't get you ferns. Couldn't get ferns. But our, 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 our team did what they could. Yeah. Right? Between two lilies. I Peace lilies, yeah, uh, right? Um, symbolism there. Um, to, to transition a little bit, right, you, you've had a career that has taken you sort of to, to many places, right, and, and some of those places is serving a, an extended period of time as a senior army officer in, in South Korea, an area with a different strategic threats and priorities than, than you would have had serving elsewhere, right? Uh, did the events of 9-11 affect the U.S. Army's presence in allied countries like South Korea, where the presence of jihadist groups like al-Qaeda has, has largely been non-existent, right? Yeah. What, what did it look like? Yeah, so, you know, I think that's, I think that's a really interesting question, right? Because it, it became a worldwide effort to source the United States Army in Iraq specifically. Mm -hmm. And so um, if, if you had, like, again, I was, I was in Korea 
uh, Dorn for Gulf War, right? Dorn Desert Storm. Had you told, had anyone said, hey, we're going to pull forces off the Korean Peninsula to bring to um, liberate Kuwait? There would have been absolutely not. There's no, there's no way we're going to do that. We did exactly that to source combat power for Iraq. And we began to pull forces, rotational units, off of the peninsula and uh, the Korean Peninsula and into into Iraq, and and that had to be. I, I was not there for that, uh, you know, in, in the late 2000s when we were doing that. But that had to be an interesting political discussion with with the Korean government, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as we were telling the Republic of Korea, hey, we're gonna we're gonna pull some forces off to go do this. Um, because again, their their focus is not on even though they had they had forces in Iraq, uh, their their focus was not on Iraq, mm -hmm. not on the potential yeah. reconstruction team they had in Afghanistan. It was was on deterring the North Koreans, right? mm -hmm. and anything that chips away at that for the South Koreans is a is a significant issue. Yeah, right. And so the the the, the interesting change was this ability for us to now start to move. Uh, combat forces off of the peninsula uh, into Iraq and then back, uh, and 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 have the South Korean government acquiesce to that. Yeah. And so th that I think that'd be a fascinating kind of diplomatic history to look at how mm -hmm. how we were able to do that. Um, and and then uh, the other side of it too is then the Koreans now realize that we we can and will do that. Mm -hmm. And so what did that what does it change the for their own sensing of the, yeah. the state of the alliance front? Right? And um, and I I think that's I think a challenge. You know, we dramatically changed our footprint um, across uh, across the Na the NATO nations as well mm -hmm. as uh, as we went through. And if you look at if you were to go all the way back, right, and look at kind of you know ninety and ninety one time frame and what we were what our footprint in Europe is at that point, mm -hmm. and then pull that forward to today, right, with the full scope of thirty years, uh, we went from 30, 30 years ago we had Two and a half core in Germany. Mm -hmm. We had three hundred fifty thousand U.S. soldiers in Germany. Yeah, right. And today you have about twenty-eight thousand, I think. Yeah, a right. significant difference. Significant difference, right? And and um, there are no tanks in Germany, mm -hmm. right? You know, U.S. tanks in Germany right now, right? We got some folks uh, Eastern. That's a rotational force, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no heavy armor permanently based in Europe right now. It's rotated in. Uh, you've got strikers and and light uh, airborne forces uh, in 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 Europe, yeah. you know, that are permanently stationed. What what was it to come back to some of the comments that you made about you know thinking about South Korean uh, forces stationed in South Korea during the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, for instance, and then what had happened more recently during the global war on terror of the 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 need or to be prepared to deploy even from a place like the Korean Peninsula to the Middle East if the the, the needs were required. What was it that had really changed? Was it this idea that the, the global war on terror was uh, of a scale that sim simply the first Gulf War was, was not? Was, was there something about our ability to, to have a more nimble army these days that, that you know, meant that that was going to be a sort of strategy going forward for our forces? Or? Yeah, I, I think, and I don't know, and this is just conjecture because of course, I, I, you know, I, I wasn't in the Pentagon for any of those discussions, but uh, my my gut would tell me it was the pressure that the army was on was under to to generate rotational combat forces to go into Iraq because we had we'd settled on this model of you know the twelve month rotation although there's two fifteen month rotations that occur mm -hmm. right so you had uh, two thousand two thousand seven and eight or fifteen month rotations yeah uh, and anybody who's done that and I have not but when you ask them hey. 12 plus three, is that yeah. 15? And they will tell you, no, it's not, right? Mm -hmm. Adding the three months to the year is, is a significant emotional event. Yeah. Uh, but the, you know, the demand for the rotational force, I think it got us to a point where we had to, we had to go look elsewhere. Where else can we, you know, generate combat power for while you're yeah. trying to reset, uh, you know, these, these one year turns, right? Uh, and, it, and again, it takes, it takes three to make one, mm -hmm. right? So for every brigade you have, on the ground in Iraq, you've got one that's just returned, and you've got one that's just training up, right? So it's three to make one, and and that's a that and you got to realize yeah. that about any kind of rotational uh, force that you're doing is it, it is a sizable commitment amount yeah. of force that you got to put in. But but the difference I think too is like when I 
when I was in Korea in 1989 through 91, it, it, when, the, when the Gulf War broke out, um, you know, my generation remembers that as the first televised war, mm -hmm. right? I, I didn't have that experience. I had, that was radio war for me. I was up on the DMZ yep. uh, in an M60 A3 TTS main battle tank. Uh, and we were, we were out doing gunnery as a show of force uh, against the North Koreans. And I can remember the discussion there being, hey, our reinforcements went from first plane down in 18 hours uh, after the outset of conflict to 33 days, hmm. right? Because the entire army had gone to, you know, had gone to the Middle East yeah. uh, to, you know, to the uh, first patriotic war, right? And so, um, and that was a, that was a different feeling on the peninsula. And I, and I went uh, from Fort Riley after I came back from Kuwait, I, I made 14 trips to, uh, 11 trips to Korea in 14 months. Wow. Uh, so as the army was getting ready, you know, the, the army was getting ready to invade Iraq, uh, the brigade at Riley was focused on the reinforcement mission into Korea. And so if you, if you can imagine that, right, 11 trips in 14 months, I was, I was jet lagged for a year, right? Because you'd fly over, you'd been, be there for like two weeks, get acclimated and then come back. And that was all trying to make sure that we had, we had at least one brigade combat team, heavy brigade in the U S focused on the, on the Korea mission. But that's, you know, that is not what the the old plan calls for for the for the response. But I think there was enough confidence in the growing capability of the uh, the Republic of Korea's military forces and and all their branches, not just their army, uh, that they were getting more and more capable of of providing the bulk of the combat power. And I think you see that today. I mean, they're, they're, uh, you know, the South Korean army is a is a very very professional, well educated, well equipped, well resourced army. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, General. If we think about sort of other aspects to, to your career too, right? You, you also served in Afghanistan in recent years uh, since the completion of Operation uh, Enduring Freedom, the sort of beginnings of the global war on terror and the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, and into Operation Freedom Sentinel. Uh, how had the war in Afghanistan changed from those early days of the invasion and capture of the country up until this past year? How has the role of the U.S. soldier changed in Afghanistan in that time? Yeah, so um, so my my first on the ground experience in in Afghanistan is 2010. Uh, so everything before that is just you know from things I've read, people yeah, I've talked totally to. Totally understand. Right? So um, and, and again, when you when you look at when you look at the initial push into in Afghanistan, very very small forces, uh, very um, limited objectives. Right? It's mm -hmm. it's it's unseat the Taliban to rid the country of Al Qaeda, right? Um, and that's really about, about it, right? It takes a couple of years for that mission to grow. Initially, uh, the NATO mission was solely in the city of Kabul, mm -hmm. right? And it expands to, you know, expands to the ISAF mission uh, throughout the country. It was American counterterrorism forces that were operating countrywide uh, in the pursuit really of Osama bin Laden uh, early on. It, it takes into the into the Obama administration to where we we begin to we begin to again kind of expand out to this uh, counterinsurgency nation building mm -hmm. um, you know endeavor that we we were on and that and that was a that was a really interesting uh, process and I and so I got involved with that in 2010 and I was I was I had a brigade that's mission was to train all the all the American. Uh, provincial reconstruction teams that were heading into Afghanistan in 2010 to 12. We did that in conjunction with the Department of State. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you think about, you know, a, a learning organization, I mean, here, here we are, we have a, an army brigade that is tied to the, you know, the uh, school of foreign service for, uh, you know, Arlington, Virginia out of the Department of State. And so, so me and a, me and a, a foreign service officer, Catherine Hoffman, we were, we were we were co-directors of training events mm -hmm. that were putting together, you know, provincial reconstruction teams made up of Air Force, Navy, Army, you know, and then state, yeah. USDA, DEA, FBI. I mean, there's, you know, all these you know, things. And, and so, you know, provincial reconstruction team was a, you know, was a was an organization that had been developed over time. Initially started in Iraq, the concept of it, and then and we brought it to Afghanistan to help provincial governments. Uh, be able to first of all understand the role, and then to um, and then effectively govern 
uh, people provide resources uh, to the people they were responsible for. And uh, as you can imagine, with all those different people I just mentioned inside those organizations, it's kind of like a petri dish, right? Yeah. Sometimes you grow penicillin, sometimes you grow mold, and uh, it was really it was really challenging, right? But but that that process of trying to trying to build out Afghan governance at the same time we were trying to build out uh, Afghan military capability uh, was was dramatic. And then immediately following that, I, I deployed to Afghanistan for a year, and I was the I was the NATO advisor to the chief of the general staff of the of the Afghan National Army. Um, General Sharon Mohammed Karimi. And, and the interesting tie back to this area of the country is Karimi trained at Fort Benning in 1971, 1973. Hmm. And so he was an older man, but I mean, yeah. at that point in 71, 73, he's a, you know, he's a soldier of the king. Right? Yeah. He's working for the Afghan monarchy, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that country goes through a, different, a, a different series, times. Of, uh, yeah. series of different governments. Um, but you know, I, the, the really interesting part for me was because I was then in the in the Afghan Ministry of Defense every day, watching you know the, the NATO interactions with uh, the Afghan Ministry of Defense, and as as they were trying to help uh, develop Afghan capacity, at the same time fight a parallel, uh, you know, really counter terror war uh, in uh, in Afghanistan, and um, and that was a really that was really fascinating to watch uh, from the from the Afghan side of that as, as they were. You know, trying to develop capacity and capability to fight initially alongside American and NATO forces, and then in the lead of American and, and NATO forces, and then eventually advised by, mm -hmm. right? And that's a process that takes takes a long time. And, and and we're reading about it today in the paper. And then there are a whole bunch of warts, you know, on that process. And so you know, corruption is a real thing in Afghanistan. Uh, it is a very survivalist mentality, right? So if you and your family have ability to have access to the money that you get through corrupt means, it's your, it's your family duty to do that, to care for your family. Um, and, you know, and this, you know, this is like watching former starving people with food, right? I mean, very, very challenging environment to operate in. Uh, but there are also very, there are some very, very incredibly honorable folks mm -hmm. uh, serving the Afghan National Army that, uh, that wanted only the best for a nation mm -hmm. um, and you know, hard to watch. Right? Yeah, which I mean, will loom large, of course, and many you know, in, in the audience today, right? Not just you as a senior military leader or me as an academic of the Middle East, but, but with Afghanistan in the news today, right? It raises sorts of lots of questions about this, right? And we, we put together a few weeks ago here at Columbus State, a sort of panel for our students and community to try and think about, you know, Afghanistan past, present, and, and maybe even future, right? But I, I wanna ask you maybe a, a bit more targeted question about this, right? Which is that, of course, 20 years have passed since the September 11th attacks and the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, there is an entire generation of US soldiers who joined up in the wake of the attacks and will be retiring from the US military, having dedicated blood, sweat, and years of their life to the cause of nation building and the support of the Afghan people. Many will have very troubled feelings associated with the Taliban retaking the country. What sorts of things would you recommend for service members who are reflecting on their own service right now and the responsibility of care that the US military and the VA for that matter may have for meeting the needs of soldiers kind of working through this experience as they you know, see, see it unfold on television. Yeah, so, so again, I think, I don't, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna draw a false equivalency between Vietnam and Afghanistan, but I think for the average soldier, there, there, may, be, there may be some parallels, right? And so we, we get an opportunity on Fort Benning to have Vietnam veterans come back mm -hmm. uh, routinely for reunions, et cetera. And the pride, uh, that those veterans have in their service and the service in their units, what they accomplished in Vietnam um, is, is, you know, dramatic. I mean, the, the bonds between uh, those men, and again, that, that era it is general, generally men, uh, is, is incredibly strong. It's based on that shared hardship of combat, that, that shared hardship of doing incredible things incredibly well in the most difficult circumstances. Absolutely. It, it, is, the, it is the same uh, for the veterans of, you know, the latest conflicts we've had. Right? So, you know, I, you know I, go, I, go back to, I go back to my battalion in Iraq and what we fought through, what we suffered through, uh, the losses we incurred, 
uh, but the victories that we had as well uh, can enrich the lives of the men and women who were in that battalion. And for those who have you know fought in the Presh Valley or you know in in, in and around the, the deserts Kandahar, uh, in in the mountains of Nangarhar, the, the the absolute fortitude of the American soldier in those environments, those incredibly uh, austere environments to to walk miles up and down hills, cross deserts uh, to bring the fight to the enemy is something that virtually no other army in the world could do. And 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 they did that. And uh, and and that for that they should have immense pride. And I say for the individual soldier who has who has fought and bled and watched uh, uh, their uh, brothers and sisters die in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, they should they should have the absolute pride of having soldiered uh, at the you know on, on the periphery of barbarism and have held it back from the civilized world. And they should they should sleep well at night. Yeah, there's a lot, lot to think about with that. And uh, I mean, it's, it's a weird situation for us to talk about it here too, right? Because of course we, we don't necessarily know what Afghanistan is going to look like even in, in five years or what our role will be in Afghanistan. And I don't expect even for you in the position that you are that you have a crystal ball to, to define these things. And so we'll, we'll kind of leave it on that. And the, the last question I want to ask you um, tonight, General, is, um, it's a bit of a difficult one. It's, it's kind of the recruitment question, right? But I, I think especially uh, where we think of the position that we are in right now in, in 2021, um, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 aside, right? We're thinking about what the global war on terror looks like now, because the reality, of course, is that this conflict is not over, right? It's, it's entered a new phase, a, a, another chapter we might think about, right? But at the same time, for, for you as a sort of senior military leader, um, at, at this moment in your career, it also presents interesting questions for you, thinking about the demographic of people who might be considering joining America's army, right? And so with all of that said, you and I have kind of discussed previously that, that Columbus, the Columbus community and Columbus State University create a unique community in large part because of the presence of Fort Benning and the Maneuver Center you know, here in, in town meaning that we have many who are watching that are soldiers, veterans, and their dependents, um, but we also have people who are considering being soldiers one day. But many of our students are also of this post 9-11 generation, right? And sort of everything that comes along with that, they are a generation that has only known the global war on terror, actually, right? And that includes actually many in the audience, either physically or, or with us online. Uh, and many of them may have become tired, actually, of the idea of the global war on terror, this being all that they know, and how long the U.S. government has, has how, how the U.S. government has handled aspects of the, the conflict. So to young critics of the conflict of the global war on, on terror, and perhaps of the U.S. military more generally, is there anything that you would say to them about the value of America's army and service within it? Yeah, so, you know, I... You know, the value of America's army, you know, your army has always been, since its founding in 1775, the arm of the government that can do the most incredible things for the people of the country. If you go back to the Depression, it, it was the army uh, that stood up the Civil Conservation Corps. It, it was the army that provided the organization around which we built national parks. And you go back further, it was the army that provided the engineers to scout the West. It was the, it was the army that provided the engineers that laid out the great railways to connect the country. If you go even further back than that, it is the army that lays out the great canal system in the Northeast of the United States. In the last year, it's been the army that, that contracted all of the vaccine in one of the quickest rollouts of a, you know, hundreds of millions of vaccination doses available to the American public. That, that was done by General Perna and Operation Warp Speed, which took the contracting structures that the Army has used and put it towards the vaccination. We just had a battalion at a 7th Infantry Division march back into camp in California after fighting wildfires in California. That's what your Army does, right, as well as it's deployed uh, in the majority of countries around the world in some, in some function, right? We, we are right now, you know, with forces in uh, the Balkans, been there since I was there in, in 1996, 
Now, we've got forces in South Korea. They've been there since the 1950s, right? We have uh, forces all over the world engaging uh, people to help, help them uh, and help their lives and help their countries develop those uh, organizations that will maintain uh, their freedoms. One of the things you should be most proud of that occurs on Fort Benning is that the Western Hemisphere of uh, Western Hemisphere Institute of Security and Cooperation, WINSEC, right? We train uh, policemen and Army non-commissioned officers and officers from all over the Western Hemisphere, right? And we and we teach uh, the value of democracy. We teach the value of human rights, and and we teach uh, the normal military and, and policing skills they require. Uh, but that that has been fundamental to our relationship across across the hemisphere, and that all happens here at, at Fort Benning. But I, I would tell you, in its in its most base form, if you're considering service in the United States Army, first off, everyone is welcome. Right? We we cannot have artificial barriers to talent. So if you can meet the physical requirements, the soldier, uh, we want you in the United States Army. We, when we think about if we were to make artificial barriers to talent in, a, in an environment where our critical adversary outnumbers us five to one as a people, we're, we're probably making the wrong decision. So, so we need to ensure there's a pathway to service uh, for everyone who meets the physical requirements to serve. And, and there is no better team uh, to be on than the United States Army. Thanks, General. Um... Before we end, is there anything that you would, you know, sort of like to say or that you would like the, the audience to know uh, um, as you sort of reflect on 9-11, your career, what yeah. the Army looks like going forward? Yeah, so let me, let me uh, take that a little different way. Please. Uh, but Brian, for, first off, Brian, thanks, thanks for inviting me out tonight. It's, it's an honor to have you here, General. Well, it, it is, it's critically important that those who are serving in uniform today, and, and especially today, given the, given the highly polarized uh, environment we find our nation in, uh, that, that those in uniform ensure that they come more than halfway to talk to the American people, because it's, it's, it's in your name that we serve. It is when we go to war, it's in your name that we fight. And so it is, it is critically important, and today more than ever, there is an open dialogue between the citizens of the United States and its soldiers. And, and that's, that's why I'm here tonight. Because it, you know, it is that important that, that we get off our bases, we get downtown, and we talk uh, to, to just Americans about what we do for them, whether it's in the, you know, the hills of California in a wildfire or it's in the hills of the Hindu Kush in a firefight. Thank you, General. Um, I think at that point, we'll, we'll conclude our conversation tonight. I, I'd like to give a, a round of applause for the, for the general for joining us. Um, and I'd like to say thank you to all of you for, for coming along and for, for your attention tonight. Um, thank you for coming to Columbus State University and for, for having this conversation, listening to, to this conversation tonight for all of you. I hope that you will continue to look out for the, the last of the 9-11 commemorative events that we'll be hosting here at Columbus State over the, the coming weeks. Uh, and we hope that we'll see you for you know, a variety of reasons on campus in the future. But thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan.